Welcome back to Indie Life Extra channel, where we bring you interesting clips from our other shows on Independence Live's YouTube, but in bite-sized chunks. So here we've got an interview with constitutional expert, Dr. Elliot Bulmer, about how you create a new constitution for a country, particularly one emerging out of conflict or leaving an empire. This is the interview we did with Elliot. Hope you enjoy it. So thank you very much for joining us. I just imagined you with a new client and a blank sheet of paper. And my first question is just, where do you start? As we live our lives, we're all members, to some extent or other, of organizations, associations, and they have rules. They have rules that, de that, that determine what their principles are, how they're governed, what standards are expected of, of their members, the, the, the promises and covenants that we make with one another that underpin our mutual obligations. And um, most countries, most democratic countries have that. They have a, a law that is above other laws, that's harder to change than other laws, which pins down the fundamentals. What is it that in spite of our political differences and the different parties and priorities that we have, that we all agree as democratic citizens of, of this country are foundational. And that may be in terms of our structures of government. How often do we have elections? What electoral system do we use? What powers do people like the prime minister have? How are they accountable? It could be issues to do with rights and it can also be issues to do with identity, right? So people put things like um, languages into a constitution the, the Canadian constitution very famously, for example, establishes kind of federal bilingualism and protects language rights and those kinds of things that are integral to identity. So I, I want to demystify constitutions mm -hmm. and just explain them that, you know, constitutions are about as interesting as the plumbing in your house. <laughs> right? You want it to be there. You want it to work. You probably don't want to have to take too much of an interest in it until it starts to stink. And when and when there's a when there's a problem when when constitutions are broken when they don't work when they don't provide uh, a sound agreed basis for mutual cooperation and for holding governments to account and for including people in the political discussion, that's when people start to notice them, right? So in a British context, we're, ha we're having a lot of conversation now about mm. the uh, inadequacy of. Britain's very unique kind of unwritten constitution. I might even call it a sort of non-existent constitution because it doesn't, it doesn't perform some of the key functions that a constitution normally performs. So most countries have a thing called a constitution. They're not telephone books. They're, they're thin little things that you can put in your pocket normally. Um, and they set out the ground rules of the state and most countries have them. I think we tend to think when we think of constitutions, people think about America mm. because hear about the American Constitution on TV, but America is actually an outlier, right? America has a very odd constitution, a very old constitution. If you're looking at a constitution today, you wouldn't look at America as your example. You'd look at perhaps other Commonwealth countries, uh, Australia, Jamaica, Barbados, etc., that have had a, a similar parliamentary system of government, but have written it down in, in ways that clarify it and, and protect it. Um, You'd look at other European countries. So you'd look at places like Sweden, Norway, Ireland. This comes back to your first question. When you start with a blank piece of paper, what do you do? Well, you almost never start with a blank piece of paper because although the constitution is a piece of paper, what you're really doing is laying, found, you're putting into legal terms, political agreements. Mm. And those political agreements are, are historically embedded, right? So. You can, you can look around the world, and if you're familiar with these constitutions, you can understand something of the history and the trajectory of a country from its constitution. Mm. So if you look at French-speaking countries in Africa, country like Tunisia, its constitution looks very French, in the same way as the constitution of Jamaica looks very British, or the constitution of India kind of looks very British. Now, there's good historical reasons for that. And generally, the the fruit doesn't fall too far from the tree. Political elites are enculturated into a system, voters understand a system, which is not to say that you can't make important changes. And let's face it, there are important changes in the British system that need to be made. Mm -hmm. um, but it does mean that those kind of changes would, would tend to go within a family of similar constitutions, right? So when you're looking in a Scottish constitutional context, you very kindly mentioned my 2015 book, A Constitution for the Common Good. 
But I developed this also in my 2016 book, um, uh, Constituting Scotland, uh, in which I, I talk a little bit about what is the vi what are the parameters of a viable and acceptable constitution in Scotland. Nobody wants a constitution for Scotland that looks like the American constitution, mm. right? Or that looks like the Saudi Arabian constitution, which is important, right? Because it's a question of what kind of state are we? Mm. They're looking at a constitution which is broadly in line with other Commonwealth constitutions and other kind of Northwestern European constitutions. Mm. So we're probably looking at a parliamentary system as opposed to a presidential system, a system in which there's a first minister or prime minister and cabinet that is responsible to parliament. We're probably looking at a, a unitary state, right? There's a lot of scope for decentralization within Scotland. But I don't think there's any desire for Scotland itself to be federalized. Um, so we have some of those parameters. We're looking at a liberal democratic system. You know, there's no desire, mainstream desire within Scotland for a Scottish state to be you know, a socialist people's republic or mm -hmm. an Islamic caliphate or a feudal monarchy. You know, we're looking, so we've got parameters there of what might this constitution look like? And I would suggest, you know, in, in very broad terms, draw a line on a map between Ireland and Norway, and Scotland is roughly in the middle of it. And I would say the same is roughly true of the constitution. That's very interesting, because one of the ones that we've been um, talking about recently is the Icelandic example of where they, um, when they first became independent, they essentially were using the Danish constitution and cross the Danish out and put Iceland on it. Yeah. Um, and then were a, a fascinating example of grassroots people getting together to come up with something which caught everybody's imagination, I think, but it doesn't seem to have resulted in an actual new constitution for them. So are there pitfalls along the way that, that we need to avoid? Oh, very much so, yes. Mm. Um, Iceland is a really good example because you're right. They did two things. One is they crossed out Denmark and put in Iceland. The other thing is they... They crossed out the king and put in the president, right? So mm -hmm. they so they established this sort of Icelandic presidency. The crowdsourced constitution of 2011 did generate a lot of interest, but it's the, the crucial part of it is that it failed. Mm -hmm. Why did it fail? Well, because elites were kept out of the bargain. And one of the things that we see, once people understand what a constitution is and why it matters and why this is absolutely essential to the building of a viable, acceptable, stable Scottish state. They then say, but we can't have the politicians involved. And I understand that because it's got to come in a sense from the people. It's got to have popular legitimacy. But if you cut the politicians out, what will they do? They'll kill it. Every good constitution, every workable constitution is a compromise. And, and the best example of this I always give is Spain. So in, in the 1930s, Spain becomes a republic. They adopt this very progressive sort of left-wing constitution that meets all of the demands for a kind of um, secular republic that's going to, to transform Spanish society. What do you get? You get a nationalist uprising, uh, a civil war, and a 40-year dictatorship. Why? Because there was no compromise. Mm. A, a constitution cannot be a partisan document. Mm. It has to be the common ground and that's so, and that comes to the same, but that's where, if you go back to the Spanish example, in the 1970s, they learned that lesson. So, in the 1970s, and it's given Spain the best democratic constitution, best period of democratic stability it's had, notwithstanding concerns about the Catalan issue. Um, but they did it through compromise. And I think that's really important in a Scottish context because. An independent Scotland will not be a, a Scotland for Scottish nationalists. Mm. It won't be a Scotland only for those who voted for it. Everybody who finds themselves a citizen of Scotland, even people with an accent like mine, will have to feel that they have a sense of belonging and identity and inclusion in that state and can live with it. We've got this great example of that not working in terms of Brexit, haven't we? How if you t you lost, suck it up. You know that is yeah. not a way that's ever going to bring parties together. And I'm just interested in um, the process by which our work on a Scottish constitution 
is going to be able to re-engage people from the no side. Yes. Um, and how we do that, because anything that we're doing just now, um, particularly even the work, the work that, that Mike Russell's doing, is by its nature more interesting right now to the people who want to vote yes. So how we actually get the no's involved, how, how do we do that? You're right, you've got to get this, what's called loser's consent, right? Mm. They've, got to, they've got to say, well, okay, it's not what I wanted, but I can live with it. I think there's a number of things there. One is to understand that none of this is about winning a referendum. Mm. Winning a referendum, as Brexit showed us, is in some ways the easiest part of this. Mm. The challenge is to build a state. And building a state means building the institutions of that state. Now, Scotland is fortunate in that we already have many of those institutions. We have a parliament, we have a government, we have a judiciary, we have 90% of a civil service. Um, but there's some things that we don't have, right? So we don't have armed forces, we don't have a diplomatic service. Um, but those key institutions have to transfer their loyalty from a British state to a Scottish state. And there are key elites in, in, in those institutions, right? And again, this is a lesson from history. Look at the Weimar Republic after the First World War in Germany. Mm. Again, an attempt to be this sort of quite progressive state, but it, it ignored those key elites. It ignored the military. It ignored the sort of established power brokers in the land. And what did they do? They turned against it. And they, they put their lot in with somebody who ultimately caused, you know, mass destruction. So it, building that loser's consent at the, at the voting level is critical. Mm -hmm. Reassuring, and this is so painful to say, because I'm always saying it to people who spent their life fighting against those key elites, mm. right? But the judges who sit in their club in Edinburgh and the people who have run Scotland quietly behind the scenes for the last 300 years are not going away. Mm. We need to find ways in which they can say, it's not what I wanted, but I can live with it. And you know what? I'm going to go and be the Scottish ambassador to the United Nations. Mm. And I'm going to go and be, I'm going to go and represent my ancient Scottish regiment in NATO or whatever it might be, and that they can transfer that loyalty. This is where the crown, I think, becomes a very important symbolic, mm. symbolic marker. And, and why I think the, the SNP policy of keeping the monarchy, at least initially, at least during that sort of transitional generation, is is quite important. It's probably less important now than it was when they came up with that policy in the 1970s. Mm. So the big debate as to whether the SNP was going to be a Republican party or not took place around the time of the, the, the silver jubilee in the 1970s, right? Mm. And the popular perception of the monarchy has, I think, changed quite a bit since then. Mm. Um, so it's maybe not quite as critical as it was, but I think for the key elites, the, the, the army officers, mm. Right? have to be able to feel that they can transfer their loyalty. So that's on the one side, that's the institutional side. Then you've got the political side. Devolution was very good in this regard. Um, you know, the Tories fought it tooth and nail. Once it happened, you know, they went with it. And you could argue that that's rolling back now. But I think that once independence happens, there's a, there's a real gap in the market for... A, sens a sensible, moderate, pragmatic centre-right party in Scotland. Mm. You know, there are, there are business interests, there are agricultural and rural interests, there are socially conservative religious voters. There's a coalition there that, that supports a centre-right party mm -hmm. that is detoxified from its unionism or, that tra or provides a vehicle for those people to, to find a role and a voice and an identity for themselves within a Scottish state. And so I think that the constitution is vital in setting a framework within which people can do that. Because what the constitution does is it says, this state belongs to all of us. Mm. It says, 
nothing fundamental if you have a sort of constitutional amendment rule that requires a referendum or whatever, it says nothing fundamental can be changed without the consent of the community of the realm. That sort of old declaration of our growth principle, which was the foundation of particularist claims to Scottish nationalism, becomes a universal claim to Scottish nationhood, mm. unites people who maybe want even to keep a British identity, but within a Scottish state. Let's yes. face it, many Scots have kept a Scottish identity within a British state for 300 years. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why people can't still feel a British identity within a Scottish state if it's a Scottish state in which they feel they have a voice, they have rights, they're not excluded, that power is public and not privatised into a particular party or particular section. So I think... Mm -hmm. I'm talking at quite an abstract level here, right? And and um, But I, I think the way I would look at it is the Constitution is the document that says we the people collectively are the landlord of the state. Mm. And the government of the day is the tenant. That's a really interesting way of thinking about it, actually. One, one of the... Um, you mentioned the, the current shenanigans going on in Westminster in particular. I've been thinking of a constitution as a sort of a set of rules, but really it, it's a set of protections almost, isn't it, from a rogue government. Um, and the idea that your constitution sits above that and it in some ways puts checks on a government that we clearly don't have on the Westminster one where they can break any rule they like with seeming impunity just because they have a a majority um, exactly. and that's the only way it's it's measured by so you can kind of see why people who want the Westminster situation to continue would be very much against the idea of a, a Scottish constitution but I think to, to present it maybe as as something that's there to protect us I think that's perhaps a more positive way of looking at it yeah I think all these understandings go together right so it's a rule book it's it's a protection it's a, it's a set of mutual promises. It's a, it's a declaration of principles. It's a statement of ethics. All of those things are kind of um, embedded in the constitution in, a different, in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think once you actually look at a constitution and see what's in a constitution, I, I would invite people to go online and look up something like, start with maybe one of the Commonwealth constitutions, look up the constitution of Barbados or something. All right. Um, you know, just look at it and have a read of it or pick somewhere random like the Solomon Islands. Uh -huh. Have a look at chapter eight of the Constitution of the Solomon Islands and you'll see <laughs> there about principles in public life. Now, does that mean that the Solomon Islands has no shenanigans? No, of course not. Because, you know, mere words on the page can't save you. I mean, you have to have the, the spirit as well as the letter, right? Mm -hmm. But what you're doing is you're signaling authoritatively certain principles, values, foundations that then shape the conversation. And mm -hmm. then what they do is they provide the key to legitimacy. Because once you go beyond that, uh, you, you, lose your, you lose your sort of claim to legitimacy. So at the mm -hmm. moment, when there are no, no real rules, right? No real rules that are binding on the government that the government can't ultimately change. It becomes about self-regulation. Whereas when you have those rules and they're stated, then it's about collective regulation. Mm. And that protects all of us. It protects the state, which is everybody, from the government of the day or from the ruling party manipulating the rules to suit their own advantage. Mm. And that could be at a really basic level. Like at the moment, there's nothing to prevent a government with its, with its ordinary legislative majority changing constituency boundaries or mm. reaching the electoral commission or introducing restrictions on the right to vote, all of which are done or being done in ways that make it easier for them to win. So they can manipulate the tools. And, you know, and are, doing, are doing in some of those examples. Exactly, exactly. So uh, if I may switch now to a sort of sporting analogy, you give the team in possession of the ball the right to rewrite the rules of the game as they go along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is fundamentally unfair, right? Mm. I mean, there's something unjust about that, which I think should speak to us not just on a practical, pragmatic level, but also on a moral level. That we mm. don't want to live in a society 
where those in charge make up the rules as they go along. Yeah. And even when you think about the, from the, the perspective of the independence of Scotland, if England is happy with their current values and rules and the way they're working, that's fine. But if we're not, and we can't get a change made because there's no constitution and we don't have a majority in there, it kind of strengthens the, the position that our, our only hope of creating our own country with our own values is as a, an independent state. I, I, I would agree with that. Again, I, I look at countries like, like Canada, right? If, if the UK had something like the Canadian constitution and had had that since 100 years ago when these things were first discussed, maybe there wouldn't be a, a move for Scottish independence mm -hmm. now. Yeah. I mean, there might, but it, I, I imagine it would be a very different thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's the inability of the British state to reconstitute itself mm -hmm. and to put its own house in order when it is so desperately needed mm -hmm. that makes me think that Scotland needs to sort of go ahead, get to grips with this. Um, it's beneficial in itself to have a well-constituted state that is institutionally bound to serve the public interest. Because the key question here is, will a Scottish state serve the public interest of Scotland better than the British state has done? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the answer to that depends on what form that Scottish state takes. Mm. Because if an independent Scotland becomes a failed state, if it becomes a sort of corrupt country run by, you know, oil oligarchs, then it probably won't. Mm. So that would be a key thing, <laughs> presumably, to make sure that the constitution that we come up with prevents that happening. Would exactly, that... exactly. Mm. To, to make sure that at the very least, you know, what, what, what do you want to protect? You want to stop the government manipulating the law. So you need to make sure you have judicial independence. So mm. things like a judicial appointments commission, you might want to put that on a, on a constitutional basis rather than a merely statutory basis. Things like an electoral commission. You don't want the government of the day being able to appoint all the members of an electoral commission to change its its rules. You want that to be protected. And mm -hmm. so you put that into a constitution. You want to make sure that you are going to have free and fair elections every four or five years. Um, that there's mechanisms of accountability of the prime minister to parliament. That the role of opposition is recognized. That the civil service, the independence and neutrality of the civil service is protected. Mm -hmm. um, that the military is properly subordinated to the elected government, but that it can't be used for sort of partisan purposes. And those are the kinds of things that a constitution can help to do. Yeah. Um, and all, all very reassuring things, just as you're listing them there. I was trying to put myself in the position of somebody who perhaps would vote no and would feel very British, but lives in Scotland. And actually, there's nothing there that you've said that I think they would be going, oh, no, we're not having that. You know, it just makes good common sense absolutely and i think that there's a lot of people out there who are by nature perhaps small c conservative mm. who are utterly appalled by the way the conservative party has moved in the last five years or so mm. um and who don't necessarily support brexit mm -hmm. and they're a bit politically homeless and i think the constitution is a way of reaching out to them as well and saying look you know you even if you're going to be in a minority in an independent, this is a crucial thing, right? Is that the parties that necessarily don't expect to be immediately in power have, have the greatest interest in some ways in protecting these fundamentals in a constitution. Mm. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we have to make every compromise to keep the politically homeless Tories happy. I'm not saying that at all. Um, I'm also not saying that a constitution should itself be conservative. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot of things which which need improvement and and particularly in terms of, um, you know, protecting against abuses of, of power, protecting against conflicts of interest, those kinds of things, which we can and should put into a constitution. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that the constitution is as much about reassurance as it is about transformation. Mm -hmm. That reassurance is not just to domestic audiences, it's also internationally. So an independent yeah. Scotland has to convince the rest of the world that this is a partner that is trusted, mm -hmm. that you can do deals with, that is not going to be perfidious in its relationship with, you know, key allies, the European Union, etc. So, you know, things in the Constitution about 
how we conduct our international affairs, how we approve treaties. Mm. Those, those kind of things could be crucial in, in building international credibility, credibility in the, in the currency markets. I mean, people don't like to have to admit it, but ultimately um, these things matter. When, mm. when we're trying to build a state that will work, right? Because yeah. there's, there's a lot of deep problems in Scotland. You know, the, the poverty and the state of the infrastructure are appalling. Mm. Nobody should be satisfied with that. Yeah. I'm here in Luxembourg, and I was at a, a public children's play park, a council play park yesterday. Beautiful barbecue area, um, all made out of beautiful woods, um, you know, climbing frames like you've never seen before. Wouldn't You know, mm -hmm. not a not a bit of broken glass or litter in sight. That's the standard that we should be aiming at. Yeah. If I want to go on public transport here in, in uh, Luxembourg, it's all free. Yeah. So we've got, we've got a lot of raising of expectations to do and a lot of raising of delivery to do. And, but to do that, we have to be institutionally stable and internationally and financially credible. I, I really like the the sort of inclusive and reassuring side of it that you were describing there. But that almost a PR version of Scotland, you know, for, for the rest of the world, I can see why that's essential as well. And I've just come back actually from Amsterdam myself and exactly the same thing. The transport wasn't free, but my goodness, one little electronic ticket got you on trains, trams, buses, yeah. boats you know, you name it, it was fabulous. And you yeah. come home and you just think, oh God, there's so much we could be doing. But then what is the point of independence if not to do things differently and exactly. better? We're in this catch-22 situation, right? So we, we can't credibly create a Scottish state without a constitutional foundation. Otherwise there's this sort of black hole on day one of independence where there's no constitutional foundation in place, right? So there has to be something. But if it's going to be inclusive, it needs, there needs to be some genuine public participation in that process. But at the moment, half the population don't want to engage in that. Mm -hmm. And if we allowed only the other half to, to engage in it, we would come up with something that's, that's too radical mm -hmm. to be acceptable to everyone. So what we need to do, I think, at this stage is to really try and, I won't say a technocratic solution, but um, a solution that builds on international good practice, that builds on the existing institutions and looks at what's been in the Scotland Act um, and other relevant legislation and kind of constitution, puts a constitutional wrapper around that. And so come up with a draft that does that. So that on day one of independence, there is something which is at least is broadly agreed by those who are saying, look, we want independence, this is our prospectus, this is what we're going to guarantee on day one. But part of that is then a constitutional review and revision mechanism that provides, once the dust has settled, because there's a lot to do in the first years of independence, mm. currency, embassies, warships, tax. Um, tax, all of this stuff needs to be done. Printing passports, what you name it, that, that, that it all needs to be done um, and we probably don't want to be doing the constitution in the midst of all of those other state building things. We probably want something that works, that is robust, that is, that is coherent, that is, that is relatively watertight. Um, but it, but it's, but it's interim, right? It, it doesn't say this is how it's going to be forever. Because there's other things that people say, well, actually, you know, down the line, we may want to reopen things like the monarchy or... Mm -hmm religion state relations or um whether scotland needs a second chamber um or the geographical dispersal of power within scotland mm -hmm. and i think there should be a mechanism for that built in and where we can say look let's get through the first electoral cycle let's get through those initial years of state building we'll see what see how what we've got works see how that all shakes out and then we can do the next stage of the constitution building process. And there's no great mystery to this, right? I mean, this is, the, this is the great thing, is that the British state in its transformation from empire state to post-imperial state has massive experience of countries transitioning to independence. And in almost all cases, they adopted a written constitution at that moment of independence. 
And those that have kept that have been, generally kept their democracies, right? Those who threw it away often went through periods of, um, of authoritarian rule before they were then able to rebuild. So yeah. th- there, is, there is good precedent. There's nothing against either the Scottish tradition or, frankly, even the British tradition mm-hmm. in writing down the essentials. It wasn't done at Westminster for the UK, but it was done by British civil servants steeped in that parliamentary tradition for places all around the world. You need to know what you're doing, but there's nothing technically difficult about this stuff. It's all been done before. I think we forget that, don't we? Just how many countries have left the, yeah. the empire and that it is a, it's a well trodden process and there is also legislation as to how it happens so absolutely yeah. and, and you know that's something that again i've written about at, at, at some length this is you know what is what is the actual mechanism for doing that again i would look at countries a good example of a country that's both european and commonwealth would be, would be both ireland well ireland's not in the commonwealth but it has a an interesting history of having been part of the uk um mm. the other one is malta and these these are countries where i think you can start to see the basic outlines of a constitution and, and not you know, don't cut and paste you don't just copy blindly but if you wanted to see you know, what might a constitution look like well that would give you an indication of the kinds of things that for example would be in there i think that that description that you gave of the, the line between was ireland and norway I, yes. I would be happy anywhere on that line i think it, it sounds about right it does and actually that's an, an interesting point that applies not just to to the constitution but across a whole range of other mm. other areas of public policy actually indeed yeah yeah